Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, though, beef is definitely what's for dinner. All those highs from the herd are turning to bovine blight. In Southern Gardening, Gary Bachman says where the landscape's concerned, paint it yellow. Plus, in today's economy, as the saying goes, you don't want to give away the farm. And in our main feature, it took a while, but they're shrimply the best. Farm Week starts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Russell. And I'm Zach Ashmore. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. For most of American history, leather has played a critical role thanks to its durability and good looks, and more than one farmer has relied on a good pair of boots to get through a workday. But more recently, leather sales have declined as faux leather products have pushed to the front of the pack. Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz with the story. Historians believe tanneries, where craftsmen turned animal hides into leather, first appeared at least 5,000 years ago in villages in the Middle East. Today, communities still gather together workers, such as these in Pennsylvania, to process cattle and other livestock hides using methods not so different from those used by their hunter-gatherer forefathers. The tanning industry is, is one of the oldest industries in the world. It's a direct byproduct of the meat industry, right? And so as we harvest animals for meat, just like the Native Americans, we try to utilize all of the components of the, of the animal. And so that skin is about six to 10% of the animal weight. And so if we can capture that and use that for other products, that helps keep it out of landfill. But tanneries are becoming increasingly rare. While colonial America had a tannery in nearly every town, these businesses have been rapidly disappearing. The number of U.S. tanneries with 50 or more employees dropped from 86 in 1993 to just 22 in 2016. According to the federal government, water treatment and other improvements to protect human health and the environment were costly for some tanneries. Many closed, while others relocated to countries with lower cost labor. More recently, international disputes and the growth in synthetic materials have also hurt the industry. Leather is a natural product. It's breathable, it's flexible, it wears over time. Uh, with synthetics, they're typically petroleum-based, which is a finite resource. The tanneries that have survived have done so largely through specialization or a focus on exporting. Tim Ng is the director of West Des Moines, Iowa-based CK International, which buys and sells pigskins internationally. Pigskin accounts for only about 10 percent of the world's leather. CK International helps connect U.S. packing plants with buyers of pigskin, mostly in Asia who then use the leather in other products. The majority of leather is made from cattle hides and used in shoes and boots, but automobile and furniture use remain significant. Over 90 percent of cattle hides produced in the U.S. are exported, China being a key buyer. The industry exported a total of $1.6 billion worth of hide, skin, and leather in 2018. Yet this was one of the industry's lowest export values since the 2009 recession. And prices for hides remain low. Still, Ng is optimistic. As we have more transparency into where products come from and as consumers demand that, um, I think the industry is really posi positioning themselves well to kind of be in play and have be part of that discussion. In Kerwinsville, Pennsylvania, the leather tannery Wicket and Craig brought dozens of jobs to town when the now 152-year-old company moved there from Toronto, Canada in 1989. It still employs about 90 people in the town of 2,500 and is one of just a few large U.S. tanneries remaining that use plant-based compounds known as vegetable tannins on the leather. 
Most use chromium tanning, a method introduced in the 1850s and viewed as the most efficient processing method. There is a small risk, if exposed to extremely high temperatures, that chromium can convert into a type known to be a carcinogen. U.S. regulations, however, govern proper disposal and water treatment for all tanneries. Vegetable tanning is the oldest form of tanning. It all comes from, from tree bark extract. Those trees are grown for the tanning industry. And while the chromium tanneries can process a hide into leather in a week, vegetable tanneries require six to eight weeks from start to finish. When you get a pile of hides in, you have no idea what you have there. We've tried to turn it as much into a science so that we can be consistent. I mean, the cattle are never going to be consistent. So those are variables that every tanner has to deal with. The Wicket and Craig Leather Factory processes nearly 5,000 cattle hides a month, most from Charlay, Simmental, and Limousine cattle because of the lighter colored hides. Cattle brands and any other imperfections on the hide reduce the value. Most of them come from the Dakotas, or we get them from the Toronto, uh, that eastern, eastern Canada region. So the farther north you go, generally the better the hides are because there's less summer, and hence the less bug bites, less, less scratching, and things like that. Bressler says the chromium tanned leathers tend to serve the automotive and garment industries, while Wicket and Craig might have their thicker leather used in equestrian equipment gun holsters, and handbags. Bressler says most Americans fail to appreciate the quality of work done in the U.S., regardless of tanning method. They think genuine leather is genuine leather, and why should they pay 12 or uh, 40 50 $60 for a genuine leather belt that the leather came from Wicket and Craig when they can buy one at, at Walmart for $12.95? It's all about education in a way. And they're, they're getting better. Why uh, our product is superior, why our customers' products are superior, that's important. You know what they say, right? March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. That's not always true, especially here in the Magnolia State. But are you looking for a sign that the end of winter is here or might actually be close? Gary Bachman says all you have to do is look for a splash of yellow. Here's Gary. Many gardeners consider green to be the color of spring, but this year, yellow is the first color popping. Daffodil blooms are for many gardeners the first visible signs of spring. These vigorous plants thrive joyously in sunny, well-drained places and are a mainstay of the spring garden. Because they are long-lived bulbs, daffodils make for a glorious landscape legacy. In Mississippi, the yellow flowers are a more traditional looking daffodil, but there are many other selections. Dutch master are early spring bloomers that display the bold yellow flowers that makes a striking planting. Fortissimo flaunts buttercup yellow petals offset by dramatic dark orange cups. This selection will add instant sunshine to your landscape and armloads of brilliant blooms from your cutting garden. Ice Follies display delightful early spring blooms with shallow yellow cups and crisp white petals. I think they look like a sunny side up egg. Paper Whites bloom in clusters of small white flowers. These have a fragrance that reminds me of gardens on warm sunny days. Our other early yellow bloomer is Forsythia, which may be one of the most beautiful flowering shrubs. Forsythia are hardy and long-lived deciduous shrubs that thrive on neglect. I love those yellow flowers lining up and down the naked arching stems. These plants are not fussy about where they're planted as long as the soil is well drained. The color yellow is certainly announcing that spring has arrived. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break right here, but coming up on Farm Week, we're headed down to the Gulf. You think New Orleans, you think seafood, right? That's where you'll find this family, experts in aquaculture over the years, and the shrimping business big time. 
In an industry that's competitive in every way, like land-based farmers, they're out early in the morning, bringing home the day's catch, still competing against foreign companies, still pursuing the American dream after half a century. Forrest Gump would be proud. We're in Nolens, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface, and always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Always wear a regulation helmet, gloves, and goggles when operating a four-wheeler. Long sleeves, pants, and over-the-ankle boots are also smart protection. Mississippi law requires approved ATV safety training for all operators who don't have a driver's license. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. Almost everyone in rural America understands how tough it is to be in business, whether it's farming or serving towns in other ways. That's why farmers and business people looking to sell their operations or acquire somebody else's might need professional help for the best possible outcome. Here's Peter Tubbs. 50 pound bags of pig feed are filled at Valley Feed and Supply in Bonner Springs, Kansas. The business had been owned by the Stubbs family for 90 years but was sold in 2018. New owner Matt Leipel wanted to apply his farming and engineering experience in an agricultural business, but wanted to avoid the risks of starting a business from scratch. The good thing about that is, you know, if it's a successful business, you're not reinventing the wheel, it's already there. You just have to, to continue to keep that wheel turning. The transaction was assisted by Red Tire, a project managed by the business school at the University of Kansas. Red Tire is the link between retiring business owners or those who want to exit their business and those who are qualified and capable of taking over the business with the benefit to the community of retaining the essential services of the community, which is key to retaining quality of life in that community. The loss of businesses like medical practices, ag-related businesses, and light manufacturing can be debilitating to the viability of rural towns. Red Tire facilitates the purchase of companies by a new owner, often an experienced professional looking to be their own boss and control their economic future. One challenge for businesses looking to sell is arriving at a fair valuation of their business. So we can build out a range of value for our valuations. Um, we, because we're uh, working with both buy and seller, we don't like to produce a, a valuation that is called a conclusion of value or a price point valuation. Instead, we give a range of value to help with negotiation between buy and seller, basically. The negotiation also includes a transition period where the seller works with the buyer for a designated period of time to transfer the knowledge of how the business works. This transition period dramatically improves the odds of success for the new owner. 
Businesses fail during a transition most commonly because customers get forgotten or the process gets manipulated in a way that is not appropriate for the business. And so it's the handoff period between the seller exiting the business and the buyer taking over the business uh, where businesses tend to fail. Red Tire has completed 60 transfers since its start in 2012. All 60 are still in operation. Dr. Deidre Trushinger bought a dental practice in Auburn, Kansas in 2017. The retiring dentist spent more than a year on staff introducing her to patients and teaching how the practice operated. Now on her own, Dr. Trushinger has seen her patient list increase enough to require the remodeling of a century-old bank building as a new, larger office. But the financial side of her business was the intimidating part of the purchase. I did not do a whole lot of research, and I think that's a testament to how awesome Red Tire is, because they did so much research for me and provided so much data. I didn't feel the need to go outside and, and get five different appraisals on what this practice was worth. They were working both sides very honestly and just trying to make a good, realistic picture of, of what, this, what the value of the practice was. For many of our participating companies, 175 of them, uh, they need to get themselves to the psychological and emotional point that they're able to walk away from the business. And something that they have devoted uh, 20 or 25 or 30 years of their life to, uh, now all of a sudden they're going to turn over uh, the relationships with their customers and, of course, the machinations of running their own business to, to somebody else. So having that emotional uh, security to be able to do that that, being at the right time of life to be able to make that transition, that's really important. For Neil Stubbs, finding a buyer with the financial ability to buy the feed mill was only half of the equation. An understanding of the work was an even bigger hurdle. And he definitely has an interest in agriculture. Uh, he seemed to, to understand the type of work we do here better than, than a lot of people do. and. Uh, being a farmer himself, uh, you know, he's familiar with heavy equipment, so, which is kind of what our mill out here is. The business at Valley Feed and Supply has evolved over the last 20 years. Situated in the corridor between Kansas City and Topeka, the demand for hog and cattle feed has declined as sales of horse and chicken feed has risen. It is also the type of business that is well suited for the Red Tire program, a sole proprietorship with good cash flow and a track record of turning a profit. Red Tire estimates there are 10,000 businesses of this size in Kansas and Missouri alone whose owners are nearing retirement and lack a succession plan. Much of the work of finding the valuation range of the businesses looking for new owners is done by students in the business program at KU. Their salaries are paid by a grant from the U.S. Economic Development Administration and allows Red Tire to be a free service to both buyer and seller. Red Tire also provides a level of transparency for the buyer that is uncommon in a typical broker-driven transaction. That transparency helps smooth the sale from one owner to the next, keeping a rural business going that otherwise would have closed. It was in our family for 95 years, so uh, it was not the time I wanted to drop the ball. Uh, we, we did everything we could you know, to make sure everything went smoothly, and I think it did. Always good to end on an up note. For the last couple of weeks, we've been telling you about this piece, a family living in the all-American dream in aquaculture. Of course, America does compete with companies overseas, and that combined with tough environmental laws makes it harder for American companies to succeed. But sometimes those odds just don't matter. Here's Delaney Howell from our news partner, Market to Market, with the story. The business of seafood can be treacherous, with many variables challenging producers. For one Louisiana seafood company, success has been measured by a pickup truck and one firm handshake at a time. After a mission trip in the late 1980s, Tommy DeLon moved back to Louisiana with his new wife. He decided to start a family and a new career in New Orleans. They just pursued the American dream and started building their business with a pickup truck, working early mornings, driving down to the docks, two, three, four o'clock every morning, getting the day's fresh catch, and then bringing it right back to the city to sell to all of the best restaurants in the quarter. 
In the years that followed their pursuit of the American dream, the DeLons would expand what is now Tommy's Seafood. They brought their children into the mix and in the early 1990s started to vertically integrate. We have control over, uh, of course, over the catch from the moment that it's unloaded all the way to the final packaging uh, at the last stage before it makes it to the consumer. So we, uh, our fishermen that we work with, they harvest the seafood for us, we unload it, we send it to our other facilities, we process it, we package it, uh, we store it, we ship it, and it's ready for the rest of the world to enjoy. Tommy's Seafood sells several types of shrimp, oysters, and blue crab. But the company's seafood mix is only part of their success. One way the DeLons are trying to sustain their family operation is to rely on the tools used decades ago when the business was taking its first steps. Growing up in St. Bernard Parish allowed me to be able to cultivate all of these longstanding relationships that, uh, that, that my family had or that I was able to make along the way with other families who have uh, multi-generational fishing in their blood. So uh, it is without a doubt one of the reasons why we're able to be so successful in this business. Of the 3.6 billion pounds of seafood landed in the contiguous 48 states, more than 1 million of that total comes ashore in Louisiana. In 1990, the U.S. shrimp catch was just over 18 million pounds, with an estimated value of $75 million. Almost three decades later, the 2018 harvest was 40% smaller at around 11 million pounds, and the final tally cut nearly in half to come in at just over $40 million. You know, we face not just competition here domestically, eh, although it's friendly competition, but we face a lot of competition overseas. So we consume about a billion pounds of shrimp here in the United States each year, and 90% of that comes from overseas, and that's 90% and counting. So, you know, their objective is to completely eliminate the domestic industry. We're without a doubt the underdogs in this business. The Pelican State's seafood industry recently received some help from Louisiana Legislature and Governor John Bell Edwards. Last month, a new law was passed requiring food establishments to notify customers when the seafood they are being served is from a foreign source. The measure was introduced to put local commercial fishermen into the spotlight and help boost small town economies along Louisiana's coast. Besides weathering the storm of ever-changing markets with overseas competitors, Tommy's Seafood has to navigate through an ecosystem that can force changes to their product line in a flash. Prior to Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the industry, the waters, the marshlands, they were a lot different than what they were today. So we started seeing a whole lot more crabs show up in this area and a whole lot less shrimp. So that was another reason why we changed our tactics of just putting all of our focus on shrimp and diversifying more into crabs. Now we unload more crabs at our dock than we do shrimp. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, it used to be the other way around. So, uh, you know, we're just finding ways to, to be creative and to make sure that we can still sustain ourselves. Those long-standing relationships are the backbone of their operation. Over the past five decades, the DeLons have expanded their reach across the Pacific to markets in Asia. They are hopeful their reputation will help them move across the Atlantic as they begin researching market opportunities in the European Union. The DeLons have no plans to stop building on their successes and will continue to stick to the family's main principles of quality product, reliable delivery, and making a deal one handshake at a time. Our Louisiana slogan, the official state motto is feed your soul, right? And so I think that they go hand in hand with one another. When you think Louisiana, you think seafood, you think food, you think culture, and it's just a, a big medley of awesomeness down here. What a great attitude, right? You gotta love New Orleans. <laughs>
over the Mardi Gras. We just celebrated that here in Mississippi. Well, next week on the show, another kind of celebration. We look back at this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. This was the 51st year. It goes all the way back to, the, to 1970. It's a big deal, of course, promoting 4-H and FFA livestock programs in Mississippi. We'll meet a couple of these talented, hardworking kids who put everything they've got into this event every year. The Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, that's next, next time on Farm Week. And before we go, we thought you might get a kick out of this. McDonald's is now selling burger flavored, I guess that would be scented candles. If you have a burning love for the famous Quarter Pounder, you can have the feeling all the time with six custom scented candles in glass containers, each one an ingredient of the Quarter Pounder. Bun, ketchup, pickle, cheese, onion, and 100% fresh beef. And like me, if you don't like pickles, just don't light that candle. <laughs> and we recently received a nice note from one of our loyal Farm Week viewers and thought we'd share it with you. He wrote, I love watching your show each week, even though I'm from Illinois and not even a farmer, retired state trooper. I find your show informative, entertaining, and professional. Thanks for your hard work. It's signed, Ron. Well, Ron, we appreciate you taking the time to write us. More importantly, thanks for watching. We hope you'll always feel the same way. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.